Long ago, a group of rogue math magicians aspired to gaze into the Quaternion hyperdimension. When the math magicians returned from this realm of chaos, they brought back forbidden knowledge. According to legend, they could harness the power of imaginary hyperdimensions to rotate a body in real space. The Euclidean geometrist condemned the Quaternion math magicians for their sorcery and banished their souls to the farthest reaches of the Cartesian plane. Many years later, a group of aerospace scientists were brutally assaulted by a fierce beast known as Gimbal Lock. The scientists desperately sought to defeat this beast in Euclidean space, but were unable to prevail. Desperate math magicians once again sought to attain the forbidden knowledge. Together with computer scientists, they forged a powerful layer of abstraction and imbued it with the souls of the ancient Quaternion sorcerers. This weapon became known as the Quaternion Library. Today, this powerful device can be safely wielded by any commoner. Thanks to the powerful abstractions and the souls of the math magicians, we no longer need to gaze beyond our dimension when doing battle with Gimbal Lock. Today, we will learn to wield this weapon for ourselves and banish Gimbal Lock from every game that we create forevermore. Well, that was certainly an intro. Welcome back to another Godot thing, sort of. Yeah, I was going to make another episode of Every Node in Godot Used and Explained. Realize I might want to talk about variants first, the most important data type in Godot, at least according to the documentation. So I was working on every variant in Godot Explained, and I noticed that Quaternions are a variant. Quaternions have a kind of silly reputation. Everywhere you go, people talk about how complex and difficult they are to understand, and it really sets you up for failure. It sets you up for the expectation of not wanting to learn them or not expecting to understand them. I did go through the process of learning how these things work, so if you want to go into that part of the math, I will link the uh, this little interactive demo thing that 3Blue1Brown made. That is not the point of this video. The point of this video is just to learn to use them. Uh, in the same way that you don't need to know how to maintain a car in order to know how to drive it, you don't need to know how to do the underlying math in order to use Quaternion. Hot take time, I actually prefer Quaternions to Euler angles. They are simpler and easier to use and understand than the equivalent Euler angles, and in fact, I have started thinking about Euler angles in terms of the related Quaternion. So when I'm thinking about rotating about the x-axis, I am now starting to imagine a vector on the x-axis that you rotate around, which is what a quaternion is. So I'm going to talk about the difference between these today, but let's start with Euler angles. Now, I know people talk a lot about gimbal lock, and that seems to be the place to start, but I don't think that is the beginning of the story. Euler angles themselves are a flawed solution to a problem, and, well, let's get into the problem that Euler angles try to solve. So, I have a couple cubes here. Uh, let me get rid of this one. We have a cube sitting in 3D space. And you'll notice we have this little rotation gizmo that allows me to grab this and turn it in one of these three uh, Cartesian units, you know, the X, Y, and Z direction. And so we're rotating around this axis here. Now, I will note, I am rotating clockwise towards the camera, which is actually negative 90 degrees, not positive 90 degrees. So I recorded a bunch of stuff, so I'm going to stick with that rotation. Uh, but our goal is going to be to rotate this to negative 90, negative 90, negative 90. So this is our final rotation. Now, that should be really easy to do, right? You just want to rotate each of the three axes 90 degrees. So we're gonna grab this one, we're gonna pull it down, we're gonna grab this one, pull it over, and then we're gonna grab this one and we're gonna pull it up. And that is 90, 90, 90, and you see the rotation is zero, negative 90, zero. What on earth is happening here? Okay, let's go back and let's do a different one. Uh, let's actually start with the X this time. So we're gonna go negative 90, negative 90, negative 90. Now our rotation is zero, zero, negative 90. We just applied the same rotation two times and got two different results. And in fact, you can do all six rotations and get completely different results each time. So it seems like applying rotations to objects, the order in which you rotate things actually matters. 
And that is really confusing when you're trying to define a rotation like 90, 90, 90. Maybe we're thinking about this wrong. We've been rotating in global space. So if I grab this and rotate on the Y axis, the X and Z just switch places. So maybe what I need to do is now rotate along the local. You also need to pay attention to if you're on the front or back, because if we wanted to rotate on this red one, we'd actually be going the opposite direction because our face we care about is facing away from us. So yeah, this is a little more complicated, but if we maybe try rotating in this local coordinate system, it'll work. So again, let's do all six rotations, and we still have six different results. <laughs> Apparently then, rotating to negative 90, 90, 90 is equivalent to rotating Z, then X, then Y in world space, or Y, then X, then Z in local space. <laughs> yeah, rotations are not cumulative, which is a math word meaning A times B equals B times A. In the rotation space, that's not true. If you rotate X, then Y, you get a different thing than Y times X. And even more interesting, if I rotate this to negative 90, 90, 90, and then I just click anywhere in the scene, it defaults to a completely different rotation that is apparently equivalent. At this point, we have tried 12 different combinations of rotating around these primary Cartesian axes. This seems like an intuitive thing to do, but it doesn't work because it's not cumulative. So this is where Euler angles come in. And... Uh, Euler, uh, this guy came up with this idea of saying maybe we use a combination of this world space and local space. So what he did is he created a virtual gimbal. So the, you can actually use a physical gimbal to represent this, which is what I'm doing here, or a digital physical gimbal. Uh, but this is how this is being visualized under the hood by the computer. So we have this object that is rotating, and inside it we have a x-axis, which is attached to the world's coordinate system. This is always rotating in the global x, no matter what else happens. So we'll see, we can rotate this cube here. And inside that, we have the z, this blue one, but then we finally have a y. Now, the y-axis rotates on this cube. It rotates along the y no matter what. So any rotation that this is, this will always rotate along the face of the cube. And then in the middle we have the Z, and this central gimbal actually rotates along the, well, it's kind of a combination of the two actually. Uh, it rotates 90 degrees perpendicular to the X and 90 degrees perpendicular to the Y. The net result of using Euler angles instead of just randomly picking Cartesian axes, either based off the cube's rotation or based off the global space, when we use this clever combination of both, we can rotate 90 degrees 90 degrees and 90 degrees, and we'll see this head is upside down, so this is our final rotation. And if I change this, uh, remember this wasn't working before, but using a gimbal, you get predictable results. Every time, no matter which slider I start with and which slider I end with, I get the same thing. So that is a super useful way to translate between this local and world coordinate system. If we play around with this a little, we can actually identify which of these are rotating in which coordinate system. So I'm going to start by rotating this in a way that's kind of off axis for most of these, and then we'll see what we can come up with. So we have this cube, and now if I start rotating the Y, oh, that looks like that is rotating around the world's Y. So I'm going to guess this gimbal starts with a Y. Next, I'm going to rotate the X, and that doesn't seem to be rotating around anything in particular, so it seems like the X might be our central gimbal. So I would expect, if I'm correct about this, that we are going to rotate around this Z axis when I spin. And sure enough, the blue one rotates around Z. I didn't check this before I set up my demo, so mine was rotating around X, then Z, then Y. But I just discovered that we are rotating Y, then X, then Z. And that is our gimbal. So the outermost one is going to be the Y, the next one's going to be X, next one's going to be Z. So we just solved this issue of being able to rotate an object predictably in this 3D environment uh, using this Euler angle gimbal concept. But what happens when I take the central ring and rotate it 90 degrees? We just established that if I rotate the x-axis, it will rotate according to this world space x. And if I rotate the y-axis, it'll rotate according to this cube space y. 
and wait a minute, these are doing the same thing. We just lost a degree of freedom. So how am I going to rotate this around this global Z right now? You'll notice none of these are pointing in that correct direction. If I turn the Y, I go this way. If I turn the X, I go this way. In fact, the only way to rotate is to first rotate either the X or the Z to line something up here. So now I've regained that final, the extra axis of control. But every time I cross through this dead zone, I lose the ability to fully rotate this object. And this causes lots of issues in animation and games. Uh, you've probably seen some bugs like this before. And I can actually demonstrate that, no, this is not just an issue with my demo. If I come in here, we established that X was the central rotation axis. So if I put X to 90, and then I try to rotate on the Y, remember, we're going to rotate on this global Y. So here we go. We are rotating on global Y. And if I come to Z and rotate on the local cube space Z, I will be rotating along the same global Y. We can only spin the cube in this direction or this direction. We didn't have a way to rotate on this global, I guess that one's Z. So that is a crippling loss of functionality. What if we didn't use these Cartesian units at all? <laughs> Forget trying to rotate along X, Y, and Z. Uh, Euler angles seems like a useful crutch if you're trying to do that, but maybe we just find a better way to do things. Quaternions are not a solution to the gimbal problem. They are a completely different approach to dealing with rotations in 3D space. And they do that by using four dimensions and then projecting them down into three. So that's why it's so complicated to understand the math behind them because you can't visualize a four dimensional object. Um, but you don't need to know the math. You just need to know what they do. And this is a vector pointing out I can change the direction or I can move it, let's say, up or down, whatever direction this is facing. This is a unit vector, to be clear. So if I point this in the direction of 111, this will be normalized. So the length is always one. And then you have a rotation here in degrees. And if I click rotate, this will spin 90 degrees around this vector. And that didn't quite look like 90, but if I click it four times, we will get back to where we started. So if I want to rotate on the x-axis, I don't need a gimbal for that. I can just point a vector in the direction of the x-axis and rotate around this point, which is exactly what we are doing. Rotating 90 degrees here is the exact same thing as rotating 90 degrees here, except I don't have all of this stuff. I just have the cube being rotated around this one vector. So that is all there really is to it with a quantum in. There is a vector in a direction. There is a rotation around the vector. You might wonder, which direction do I rotate? Well, that's where the right hand rule comes in. So if you make a fist, stick your thumb out, the direction that your fingers curl are the direction that this is rotating. So rotating 90 degrees, you can expect that this will turn counterclockwise towards the camera. If I click rotate it, there we go. That was a counterclockwise 90 degree rotation. If I point the vector in a different direction, uh, it'll be the same thing. So this will be rotating this this direction counterclockwise around that arrow rotate and there we go and so this arrow can point in any direction and you can rotate around it so this is quaternion rotation a <laughs> very simple and straightforward no nonsense it just gets the job done if you want to rotate this around a particular axis you point a vector in the direction and spin around it so that's what it's doing. You may notice down here, I'm printing the rotation quaternion, and this looks a little bit different than this. So I mentioned that these are normalized, but there's actually a double normalization going on. So coming over to this thing I will link, um, if you want to convert from the vector angle rotation that I've been using, you're going to take the cosine of this angle and then multiply the sine of the angle by this uh, three-dimensional normalized vector we were using, and that will give you a four-dimensional normalized vector vector, where this is the angle converted into a number, and this is that vector uh, converted down to be normalized in four-dimensional space. So that is how you get these numbers out of it. We don't have to actually do that, though, because if we go back to Godot, we have uh, functions that'll do that for us. 
So in the code, first thing I did, when I have this demonstration running, you notice that there's an arrow pointing in the direction of this vector. This took me way too long because I started down the path of using Euler angles. I tried to Google, couldn't find much help, so I went to ChatGPT and ended up coming up with this ridiculous solution. This was like an hour wasted. I finally realized that I could just use quaternions. It turns out there is a constructor for quaternions that takes the direction that this is facing when it's not rotated and the direction you want and gives you a quaternion that rotates that. And you can assign that directly to the quaternion value of your transform. And that is the same thing as assigning the XYZ rotation in Euler angles. So that's all it takes to make an arrow point in a direction you want it to point. Uh, but it took me forever to realize that quaternions were the answer, Euler angles are not. On the same vein, for the actual rotation I'm applying to this thing, I am taking that IJK component. I put this into a constructor along with the angle. Uh, we use radians in Godot, so I'm converting from degrees to radians before I pass it in. And this constructor will make a quaternion uh, from that axis and that angle. You can also create it using these basic four values. That was just the sine and cosine I was showing here. So you are more than welcome to do that by hand, but if you want to use the constructors, they do that work for you. Finally, when I am rotating this, when I press this rotate option, uh, it'll calculate a final rotation. Notice that you don't add quaternions, you multiply them, uh, but multiplying these is uh, the same thing as adding angles. So this gives me the final angle that I want. Um, I also will sometimes call normalized. If they recommend you do that just to make sure you don't get math errors with floating points. Uh, but so we will do that to get the final rotation. And then I'm just using the slurp function to get there because I haven't learned the animation yet. And there's probably a better way to do that. Uh, but so that is how I am slowly moving this cube when I rotate it uh, for the demonstration instead of just snapping it to that position. So that's how this goes. That's all you do for rotating, but yeah, these can be applied directly to the transform here uh, using that quaternion value. And that is the same thing as if I come into the transform here, you'll notice the rotation edit mode is usually set to Euler, but you can set it to quaternion, and that's how you get this four number value. Again, it's a little bit complicated to deal with these numbers directly because you need to use the sine and cosine on uh, this normalized three-dimensional vector and this uh, final value. So it may be a little bit easier to just plug it in using that uh, uh, vector and rotation instead of converting it into the final uh, four value quaternion mode. Um, but so yeah, that is all there is for that code. Uh, just creating quaternions, applying it directly, or using a you know animation function to slowly move along that. And because I'm animating directly along that vector, there is no concern of gimbal lock ever. Um, again, if I am rotating this using the gimbal, things can go really wrong. But if I'm rotating this when using quaternions, it is rotating directly along that arc, and there is no other way that it can rotate because it's not a combination of things, it's just a simple smooth motion. Yeah, that's about it for quaternions. Uh, honestly, I, like I said, really prefer them to Euler angles now that they make sense to me. So yeah, hopefully this has been useful. A little bit of a interesting deviation from my normal stuff, but at this point I don't even know what videos I'm making anymore. So <laughs> let me know what you think, um, and I will be back with more tutorials, but also hopefully working on my own games in the future. Uh, yep. Yeah. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. The Euclidean Geometrisk. Geomet <laughs> the Euclidean Geometrist. Scientists were brutally assaulted by a fierce beast known as Gimbal Lock. Nope. Lock from every game that we create forevermore. Forevermore, that's right. <laughs> was this a dumb idea? This was a dumb idea. You really like the microphone, don't you?